welcome to Fuel Podcast. I'm your host, Leela Ansart, leadership advisor and certified executive coach. On this podcast, you'll hear the stories of successful individuals and how they were able to overcome adversity by channeling strength from an internal driving force. My mission, shine the light on alternate strategies that can move you from reactive to strategic thinking, from overwhelmed to motivated, and from burnout to balance, so you can move forward and over-deliver on your current goals. Let's dive in. A huge shout out to podcast listener LD, who recently wrote in a review saying, Leela's podcast brings in thought leaders making a difference, and the conversations bring new insights to work, life, and leadership. Thank you so much, LD, for taking a moment to help share the word about Fuel Podcast. Definitely, when you get a chance to listen to the rest of this episode, if it speaks to you, if it's just juicy and amazing, I encourage you to leave a review and you may be featured in a future episode as well. Thanks for joining us today. Our podcast guest is Amy Huang, who serves as Director of Onsite Technical Support at Marsh McLennan. Let me tell you, I so enjoyed speaking with Amy, who is a champion for diversity and inclusion. She's held several roles that align with this mission, such as being the facilitator for the Technology Advisory Council on Race and Diversity at Marsh McLennan. She's been a representative on the MGTI Diversity Council, global lead of the Buddy Program, mental health champion, and global ambassador for Lean In Circles. She's passionate about making a difference for others, serving as board member for the Wesley College Alumni Association, as well as serving as a mentor for the Wesley and Washington Program since 2009. Fun personal fact, Amy's proud of setting up two of her friends who've been together for over 15 years and recently got married. Pretty cool. Listen in as we hear more of Amy's story. Welcome back to Fuel, everyone. We're excited to have you listening in today, and I'm thrilled to have Amy Huang in my studio today. I'm interviewing Amy, who is the Director of On-Site Technical Support at Marsh McLennan. Amy leads 40 plus technology professionals and together her team supports four countries, over 90 locations and 5,800 plus colleagues. So she has got quite the job that she manages. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Leela. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're going to talk today, Amy, and thank you again for your time about your journey around your professional career, what you've experienced. And I'm just gonna dive right into the meat of the matter, which as the listeners know, is all about identifying your particular fuel. So that's a bit of a play on words that we like to um, to have fun with here on the podcast, but shining the light on the human experience that you have had um, as a business leader And what has been that internal drive for you to continue moving through the adversity that you faced with grace, with resilience, and with um, assertiveness, I would say, in this particular situation? Thanks, Leela, for having me. I would describe my fuel as being a voice for people and as being an opportunity to create an inclusive culture where everyone can thrive. Um, You've heard a lot of press around empathetic leadership and how a lot of issues have really just come to light in the pandemic. You know, with Zoom, you're in people's homes, you're seeing their families, you're seeing their pets, and you're really getting a sense at a very personal level of what everyone goes through. And that veil between the personal and the work has come down. Um, And hopefully out of this, we get much more empathetic with our colleagues and each other and and can share more and create those stronger bonds among us. I uh, 100% agree. I think it's 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 a timely move. It's a change, not just that's uh, happening because of the pandemic, but I think it's certainly been pushed forward at, at a much quicker speed because of the pandemic. Um, I think everyone is just has moved past that old stand and control and and, control um, yeah Yeah. command and control thank you um that is just so outdated in this day and age knowing that um people are the ones doing the work that's what i i love to talk about is shining the light on the humanity that we have in the workplace it's not about just the output it's not about just the numbers it's balancing all of those things with the people your greatest asset and and how to do that i think it's so necessary 
I find it um, refreshing to hear you say that that's your particular fuel out of all the things that could drive you in your experience. And um, from some of what you've shared with me, there's some particular reasons for that. So share with me a little bit about what you've been through and how that that um, fuel source has crystallized for you. Sure. I, I think I've been thinking a lot about my parents um, lately, especially with the rise of anti-Asian violence and that within my father's lifetime, right? He had gone from a farmer in Taiwan to getting a PhD to leading a technology team at a company and to have a daughter um, also follow in his footsteps um, at first unwillingly, um, but to really join and take um, his, his very empathetic leadership forward and as well as lead a technology team. And it just is amazing to me that on the because of the choices he made, I have better opportunities. And I think about that for others in an organization, because as we're in a war for talent, as we're building a more inclusive and diverse and equitable workplace, we have a lot of different experiences and different people to bring together. So, you know, I hear the term like this person wasn't a good fit or this is not this person doesn't fit our culture. And I challenge that because we are really kind of about expanding the pie, right? What are they adding to the culture? Do they necessarily want people to fit in when really they're additive? You know, what are they bringing to the table? How can they make our our culture better? And I love your point about people. You know, Marsh McLennan is a professional services organization and we have our 150th birthday and our CEO, Dan Glazer says, we are people business our wealth is in our people. And I feel the same way. My team has been incredible throughout the pandemic and really sort of at the front lines of making sure that our colleagues have the technology they need to work from anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, I'm just, you know, my eyes glaze over a little bit when I look at the number of people that you support. So I'm, I'm sure that's a huge job. Um, tell me a little bit about your experiences around the the subject of, of DEI and, and how you personally experienced that end of things. Absolutely. it's It's been interesting, and I love the term intersectionality because it comes and describes so many things, right? Being um, the daughter of immigrants, being of Asian descent, um, being a woman in technology, being a non-traditional technologist in, tr- in technology, mm. as well as part of the LGBTQ community. So for me, um, there's a lot of different variables and situations that I navigate, and I'm not exactly sure what they're based on or why they certainly happen. Mm. Um, so the things that I've, you know, I'd like to firstly say that I've been very fortunate and stand on the shoulders of giants and other people who have worked so hard. Um, I remember thinking that marriage would never happen um, Mm -hmm. and that I was very surprised when the Supreme Court said that you cannot discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. Yeah. Um, Very within the past year. um, And that was really amazing to me. And so the things that occur I really would not want to happen to anyone. And it could be as minor. I had a boss who would make fun of my name and just say, Huang, um, just for fun. And I have team members who have been told, well, if you know, wanted me to pronounce your name correctly, your mother shouldn't have named you something different. Um, oh my goodness. And literally said that to them. I've also had team members who were given nicknames because people did not want to learn how to speak their original name or their real name. So I would spend a lot of time listening to their voicemail, just really learning, <laughs> uh, making sure, because yeah. I'm actually terrible with names myself. And so um, learning their names. And then, you know, you have, I have a situation, unfortunately, where my boss, another boss would text me and say I was beautiful and sexy and asked me out and that was very uncomfortable because I did not have HR support in this particular organization. So I had to navigate that very carefully. Um, I had another situation where um, I was on LinkedIn and my profile on LinkedIn is, is very generic about the differences that I have. And I've internalized a lot of homophobia. So you, you won't kind of find clear communities that I, um, am aligned with and I received a message from a client that said sex and sexual orientation don't belong in the workplace I'm disconnecting from you on LinkedIn and that really 
surprise me because there's really nothing in there that would state that. Um, and the other piece was it was it was so um, direct. And I remember it because it occurred during kind of the North Carolina bathroom crisis where a lot of these um, feelings from people were very strong. Yeah. Um, so I remember, wow, that directly impacted me. Um, and it directly impacts a lot of people. So I, I have a lot of empathy for a lot of people who are trying to go through that. And sort of the last situation um, that I want to mention is that as someone who is an other, how do you navigate the workplace where a lot of decisions and conversations happen unofficially through networks, through networking events that may not be open to you? So I had thought I was going on a very normal client event and that turned really negative, really personal, really intimate and very uncomfortable very quickly. Um, and so that was another experience that I really want to share so that other people don't have to go through it. Mm. I remember you shared this experience with me when we spoke last. And if I may expand uh, based on what you told me. So Amy had gone to a networking event thinking she was networking, <laughs> building her business relationships. And instead you had a, a client or whoever it was, a, cl a colleague, ask you totally inappropriate questions based on you being in the LGBTQ community. Am I remembering correctly? Yes. So unfortunately, women, Asian women, queer women are fetishized and objectified in mm -hmm. society. There's mm -hmm. just this kind of image around them. There are some times where it's it's very innocent um, inquiries like, oh, you're the first LGBT person I've met, which is probably not the case. And then I have, you know, some questions um, and, and they could be very innocent questions. Um, and then unfortunately, the, these questions became increasingly uncomfortable and intimate where the client shared their own personal details, which I did not ask for, um, of things that their, they and their partner do. Um, and I always tried to bring it back to, oh, your child is in ballet. Like, what is that about? Let's talk about other yeah. things. Yeah. Um, which then led to questions about me and my partner um, of things that I do not discuss with, um, well, anyone really. <laughs> right, right. That's your personal business. I think it's interesting as we talk as a society about being more inclusive and more, and I love that, that, that phrase, culture of belonging that it's, it can sometimes feel a bit like, you know, navigating a minefield or, or you know, trying not to, to step on a, a glass that's been shattered on the floor um, in the sense that maybe the individual is curious. Maybe they haven't been exposed to someone who's confidently who they are. Um, the, the idea of of taking the conversation into such a personal realm when you can, there's a lot of ways to get information. People it does not need to be with that colleague that you're sitting across the coffee shop from. Um, but, but like going back to my point, you know, around this culture of belonging, I think that those of us who are trying to practice being more inclusive and being more curious, that's kind of the word that comes to my mind. We can sometimes be nervous about asking the wrong thing or how do I, how do I make someone feel welcome without making them feel uncomfortable because I'm asking about what appears to be a difference between us? How, well, how would you speak to that, Amy? I think think about what you would normally ask, right? If I was speaking to a heterosexual male colleague and said, oh, how how is you know, your wife? How are you doing? How was your weekend? And you would say, oh, you know, we took the kids to soccer. I mean, there are very basic conversations and so when yeah. you're engaging in those conversations like that you know hear about the soccer or the dog training and those are fine and then you know you almost have to self-filter because maybe you do have a curiosity maybe you have um kind of been sucked into some biases and cultural discrimination that has you know that's sort of part of the wiring like we all have biases that we're um working on and there are things like, you know, would I ask 
this to anyone else. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think that there's a, and we talked about a disconnect, right, where I could be saying, hey, you know, Bob, how is your wife, Janet? How is that sourdough pizza that you're making in the backyard that you mentioned? You know, that seems very normal. And then there may be, you know, a, a bias that comes back. Well, if I, you know, Amy has a female partner, you know, this means I can ask about, you know, things that they do. And then I think, you, you know, it, it's, it's me asking about your wife and your family and, and what you're going on. And then a disconnect around, well, that's, you know, Amy and her female partner, well, that becomes sex and sexual orientation right. in the workplace when it's really, we went rock climbing. You know, right. that's what we did this weekend. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. It's really coming back to just people and your family unit and how, whatever you want to refer to it. But like, what are you doing for fun? What are you learning? How's work going? I mean, it it seems so incredibly basic when you break it down. But at the same time, I think that sometimes, um, you know, uh, pulling the, the bad apples outside of this statement because there's always just jerks out there. Let's Let's be plain and simple. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes people just get, they end up coming across in a way that I don't know that they intended to, again, bad apples aside. Um, and I think one of the ways that we can show belonging, that sense of belonging is being, in my opinion, genuinely curious and then paying attention. Like if you are in a business role where you are doing uh, sales or you're doing account management, where you're working with clients, you know you have to do some of those networking type activities. It would be great if you could remember your client's significant other's name. It would be great if you could remember they have three kids and a dog or they like to show their puppy. It would be great if you could remember those details so that you can ask about them in future conversations and it builds trust and it builds relationship and all of those things. Uh, build into better business relations, relationships. So I feel it's the same with um, with when we're exposed to something that's different than us, whether that's you know LGBTQ, whether that's uh, someone of a different race or of a different descent, whether that's just someone who is doing a job that you know nothing about. Um, but being willing to say, "Hey, I'm curious about you. You know, what do you like to do outside of work?" or um, you know, do you have anything you're working on learning right now? You know, opening those conversations and then paying enough attention to bring it up later and show that person that you really care. And I'll tell you, that's easier said than done. I'll be 100% uh, transparent when I say I use my phone. When I add a contact into my phone, I mean, we all have CRMs, right? If you have a CRM, that's your, that's your easy solution. But if you don't, when, when you add that person into your phone or into your Outlook contacts, just put in the notes section a few things like significant other's name or they mentioned these hobbies or, or what have you. And that way it helps you to relate back to that person from a genuine point, which may, may be where your heart is, even if your memory isn't always kicking in and helping you with that particular bit of information. I love um, your piece about navigating minefields. And I think this is especially um, important for people who sort of don't have this trajectory. Something I've really liked about the pandemic is seeing how parents and children have become more connected because the parents are home and the child's being homeschooled and they can kind of see, I've heard great stories about parents saying like, I loved learning this lesson with my kid and I saw my teacher teaching my kid about this and I thought that was great. And the kids are learning what um, the parents are doing. You know, one of my friends is a CFO and was talking to a client and in the back, she heard her seven-year-old son scream like, it's about the money. And like, <laughs> you know, the kids are really absorbing all That's of this great. as you're with them. And I think this is a tremendous opportunity to, to learn. Um, and I feel like if you sort of haven't had that background, if your parents don't have that background and you're navigating this world yourself, it's, it's I think, really, really challenging. And the norms are really challenging. And I have a lot of kind of um, anxiety around this. And in fact, I had a um, client visit very recently. And I think we're all sort of rusty at this because of the pandemic and yeah. being at home <laughs> and may have and said some things that were like, I'm like, oh, why did I say that? Um, and so we're going to make mistakes. Diversity, equity, inclusion is 
messy. Um, yeah. We're going to need to learn words. We're going to need to stand up for each other. And we'll talk a little bit later about things that we can do that are very helpful for this. And you do need to pay attention, like you said, and have your filter on and remember that this person is a client or a business relationship and that there really are things that are really inappropriate to speak yeah. about. Amy, you, we had talked about some of the things that you felt were uh, were really good first steps or, or maybe perhaps clarifications on how someone can be a bit more supportive and lean into being uh, creating an inclusive environment at work, specifically around the LGBTQ community. Would you share those with us? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So I think first and foremost, you gotta read the room and you need to know that your organization stands behind you, that your organization has a clear policy, that HR will support you, that they monitor the workplace, that they take complaints seriously. Because if you kind of are working in a place where those things aren't there, I had an experience where I didn't feel that I had a strong HR. And a lot of people don't report workplace harassment because they don't know um, what's going to happen. And that mm -hmm. retaliation does take place. So if you are a leader in an organization, you're going to want to set clear policies, make sure that, you know, your t colleagues and team members feel comfortable and safe. That psychological safety of coming forward and then being taken seriously when they do come forward. I will share with everybody that when I have reported this to HR, it was taken very seriously and HR has to do their due diligence. So um, there was a number of kind of testimonies that I had to offer repeatedly um, and those can be re-traumatizing so just for those mm -hmm. who do have an experience and and are going to report it that you may be asked to go over that experience a few times to make sure that all the details are there and if you have the comfort in your HR that you know things will be taken care of I really recommend that you do so and you can be an ally Mm -hmm. and be committed to building an inclusive environment for your team. Be an upstander, right? So we talk about bystanding, but how do you upstand? If you hear something, right, and you hear a joke that's really inappropriate or you hear somebody say something. I was on a, I was on a call, Zoom call recently, and a person was making derogatory comments out loud about the woman, female speaker's appearance. And I, I couldn't even believe it. Their mic was on and they didn't know they had a hot mic on. And then another man on the call said, you know, hey, person, your mic is on. You may not want to be sharing those things with all of us. So upstanding, standing up when you hear something that is really unacceptable is a great. And you need to feel safety to do that as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, the clear policies training for colleagues, supervisors and managers on what, how to identify it because there can be a gray line um, and then there's certainly clear lines so how to identify it how to report it um, how do you support your team members if it does happen to them um, monitoring the workplace taking the complaints seriously mm -hmm. may i add something in here and i would like your honest take on this amy because you're you're living it and you're a, a champion for this cause and i'm by no means an expert and just trying to do my part um you know i think i think something that i have learned um i have a middle schooler and there's a lot of conversation going on right now in that particular age i'm sure i'm sure in high school as well i just don't happen to have a high schooler but there's a lot of conversation around gender identity and um, and sexual orientation and, and who is and isn't what. And there's so many new terms flying around that I thought I was in the know and I have increasingly learned more and more. Um, but one of the things I, I wanted to bring up is I think sometimes it comes back to just coming back to a place of humility that I might make a mistake, you know, again, bad apples aside, but sometimes I think we make mistakes because we don't think through what we're saying, uh, or perhaps we've said something before and not realized how it could come across. And I think coming back to just a humility for a, a, a genuine apology in the moment to say, you know what, that doesn't represent how I would like to come across, or that doesn't represent how I actually feel. And I apologize for saying that. Um, I've had to learn that because of my middle schooler. She has called me out on some things that I had no idea were even 
remotely, slightly, you know, angled towards derogatory. I just hadn't thought of it that way. And when she said something to me, now I realized in that moment, okay, like I've got, I've got some learning to do. And I think there's something to be said for, I think everybody is, is, uh, nervous about missteps and about making mistakes. And I think just coming back to realizing that it's better to take a step towards being an advocate and being the kind of person you want to be. And then if you make a mistake, you own up to your mistake, you apologize and you move on. And I I would imagine that that is just a a good reminder for all of us to have. That is a hundred percent true. And it it is messy terms change constantly Mm -hmm. um, and we're learning that ourselves we do have um, family members who have come out as trans who are have come out as asexual who have come out as trans and asexual right so there's a lot of stuff that and I'm I'm told that I'm an owl and older wiser lesbian so there are terms that (laughs) I didn't know that one as well um, so we are learning all the time and I love that you said because in yoga it's called the beginner's mind And so, you know, we can't expect to know everything. And there are so many um, really kind of racist things in our everyday language that we've never thought about. Right. So so even things like, you know, when people say open the kimono or a game of um, Chinese whispers, uh, which was Mm -hmm. the first time I've heard about it this year. And that, you know, I said, can we use, you know, playing telephone? instead of Chinese whispers, because the origin of that is people had thought the Chinese language was just incomprehensible. Um, and so it's really fascinating, right? That there are very common things that we say that have these undertones that we may not be even be aware of. So just kind of yeah. thinking through. And then there are things that very positive things that we can do in the workplace. Something I try to do is just really take gender out of everything, um, you know, instead of a job description, he removes servers, right? Like the technician, the technologist, the the candidate. Mm -hmm. Um, There are definitely things that we can say because we have folks who do not subscribe to a gender who, you know, or consider themselves differently. And and why do we even have to speak in that way? There are some languages where gender is very important and, you know, that's and there's changes in there as well as like how can they remove the gender aspect out of language um and just make it equal imagine that an equal language right it's in the words are so important yeah as we wrap up amy what do you think is uh, maybe that one quick takeaway that you'd like the listeners to take from today's episode i think and we talked about this earlier, I think the one thing I'd love our listeners to take away is to have that beginner's mind and and that humility that you talked about and that we don't know everything, we're not gonna get it all right. The world is shifting and changing um, and we have an opportunity to really learn and have meaningful conversations about our colleagues, what they're going through um, and if they are comfortable sharing that and recognizing when they're uncomfortable <laughs> um, and then making apologies if we do perhaps make a mistake and we will make mistakes, all of yeah. us make mistakes, that's human. And so um, to move forward together with the intent that we're here to make lives and our workplaces safer and more enjoyable for others. Yeah. I really appreciate you being willing to come on and share some of your personal story and, you know, what you've experienced. I think it's really good for people to hear from others, you know, what, what life feels like when you're, um, you know, you're in a different, um, camp than the, than the listener is, you know, for whatever that is different in, in any different way. Um, but I really appreciate it because that's not always an easy story to tell. And I appreciate that you, um, we're willing to be there and share the, your passion for DEI and the work that is being done in that field. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, Amy. Great to talk to you. This podcast is brought to you by Leadership Impact Strategies. We help today's business leaders to navigate the people challenges of this pandemic era. With a focus on compassionate leadership, we help you eliminate team dysfunction and increase your own leadership capability, resulting in higher profits, sales, and results to your bottom line. Like what you heard on today's episode? 
Turbocharge your own leadership by grabbing our free resources. Discover your leadership strengths and potential blind spots with our leadership quiz, or grab our free checklist for holding an engaging team meeting. Find them both and more at www.leadershipimpactstrategies.com forward slash resources. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to Fuel Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts so you'll be notified of every new episode. Until then, I'm Leela Ansart. Here's to you finding the fuel you need today. Today.